Hi, my name is Petra Lewis from the Geisel Medical School at Dartmouth, and this video is to talk a little bit about different active learning techniques. What I want you to keep in mind throughout this presentation is it's not what you teach, what you decide to deliver to the audience, it's what they learn from it. And that's the whole key premise behind active learning. What's the definition of active learning? Well, this is when your learners are involved in some form of an activity that promotes the analysis of the content, the synthesis of it together, or the evaluation. So this is not active learning, but this is active learning. This is passive learning, where these students are involved in active learning. All of these students involved in some form of an active learning exercise, well, these are how we typically spend our time in passive learning. Now, you may well have seen this pyramid before. It was developed back in the 1950s. What it's looking at here is how much we learn from any one activity. And you can see these passive learning activities. We tend to retain very little information where these more active learning types of activities, we retain a heck of a lot more information. Another way of looking at this is from Bloom's Taxonomy of Learning Objectives. Again, you may or may not be familiar with it. But the basic concept is that the lower order skills are those such as understanding and remembering. And this tends to be what we deliver when we um, have a didactic lecture to our learners because they're not applying the information where the higher order skills, which is how we want generally our learning objectives to be focused, are creating, evaluating, analyzing, and applying that topic. And that's where we want our learners to be. And we want them to go from being a novice to an expert, acquiring mastery of whatever skill we're trying to teach them. Over multiple studies through all levels of education, um, active learning has been shown to increase the retention of information, the attention of the learners, their performance on some form of a test or skills-based assessment, how satisfied they are with the learning process, how much they perceive the challenge to be, and even has improved graduation rates. Here's just one small example. Um, this is, you can see, a little older now, 1999. And this was a um, physics course. And they had a typical didactic physics course. And they tested the um, uh, knowledge base of the learners um, after this traditional instruction, as well as before instruction, and then after they had um, developed a new interactive active learning type curriculum. You can see here um, these just three different things that they were looking at, the knowledge of the students. Uh, um, there was remarkably little improvement from pre to post with the didactic teaching methods, but much, much greater with the active learning methods. One thing that does seem to be clear from this, however, is that to be able to retain knowledge long term, you have to apply it. You not only have to apply it, but you have to apply it relatively soon after you've learned it. So as they say, use it or lose it. So this was came from a study where the um, learners were asked to memorize a long list of vocab words, and they were then either asked to um, apply them in um, some writing in uh, different times when they learned it, either an hour later, a day later, seven days later, or 21 days later. And then they were tested to see how uh, much of that information they actually retained on differing distances out from the initial delivery of the information. So as you can see here, if they waited three weeks before they actually had to apply the information, they'd forgotten nearly all of it where the one hour and the one day that actually retained a significant proportion of it. So what else has active learning been shown to do? Well, it's been shown that it significantly improves how well the learners actually understand the information because you're able to test that right on the spot. It reinforces the key concepts that are important for them to remember. It enables them to put different parts of information together to synthesize an appropriate diagnosis for example, because during all of this, they're really applying the information. So they're going to have improved application of this information during their day-to-day -day work. And then it helps with far transfer of learning. Far transfer of learning is where they're able to take the information that they were given or applied during the active learning session and be able to apply it to much more different examples than those that they were actually tested on. Now, just to note here that the LCME, 
So the, the body which governs undergraduate education has a very specific definition of active learning. And this is um, shown here that they have to independently or collaboratively actually identify the learning objectives themselves and then seek out the knowledge to meet those objectives. And it has to be very much individually prepared and that they contribute to group learning. And, you know, this is not what we do in most typical active learning sessions. And in fact, from the LCME point of view, only problem-based learning fulfills these criteria. So what I'm going to discuss uh, later during this talk is what the LCME actually calls engaged learning, not active learning. But, you know, for all intents and purposes, that's not applied outside of the LCME environment. And that's when the instructor determines what and how a student should learn, but the student participates in that learning process. So how can you incorporate um, active learning into a particular session? Well, there's different ways to do it. Um, you can do it as part of the flipped classroom. So when students are given some form of a pre-learning task, often the basic knowledge or skills, um, which they do outside of the classroom, and then active learning as part of a facilitated group. I'm not going to talk further about flipped classroom. I have a separate video on that. Or it can be done as a component of the didactic session, or it could be the entire um, session that you're doing. Now, while most people think about active learning um, sessions as, as involving a small group of individuals, you are able to do this in a large group. If you want to see more about how um, active learning can be done in a very large group, um, I suggest that you check out the videos of Eric Mazur. He's a physicist from Harvard who has very successfully used active learning methods in classes of several hundred and has significantly improved the physics scores of his um, undergraduates. Um, let's check him out on YouTube. He has a bunch of videos there. So let's move on to thinking about how we design active learning exercises. There are different ways that you can incorporate these active learning exercises into a session. I've shown you one more complex uh, session here where we've interspersed little assessment at the beginning and at the end with didactic components, little short 10 or 15 minute dictations, uh, uh, didactic type teaching with um, these little two little active learning exercises, but other sessions you might do just one didactic or no didactic and everything be active learning. And now I've mentioned that dreaded word learning objectives. Learning objectives are really key here. Um, before you start developing any kind of a session, whether it's a didactic teaching session or active teaching session, you've got to have your learning objectives, not your teaching objectives, your learning objectives. Um, see Nancy McNulty's excellent video about this. Now, when you look at your learning objectives, you want to identify those which are going to be best suited to some form of an active learning exercise as opposed to didactic teaching or for them pre-learning in advance of the session. And generally speaking, these are going to be those with the higher blooms, as I showed you before. It's also going to depend very much on the setting. You know, what you can do perhaps in a, a large auditorium with a couple of hundred students is not going to be what you can do in a fully equipped sim lab or even in your sort of regular conference room. So it depends on where you are. It's going to depend on the learner group. Are these um, novices? Are they more experts? Are they students? Are they CME people? And how much time you have available for the session is, and we'll talk about that further, is obviously going to markedly uh, limit what you're going to be able to do. And I would recommend that for any learning objective, you start to brainstorm several different alternative ways of teaching that information in an active manner. And there is some degree of trial and error, and you're going to find over time as you experiment with a couple of different these, you'll find some formats work very well for you or for your particular learners, and others don't work so well. It really is very important, however, that you don't let the tail wag the dog here, that you let the learning objective drive what are appropriate active learning exercises um, rather than the other way around. Now, there are some important time issues to note here. It's going to take longer than you expect. However long you think that this particular exercise is going to take, it's probably going to take twice as long as that. And to try and reduce this sort of wasteful time, um, you need to really be well prepared. So you need the audience to be prepared. So you need to have let them know in advance what's going to happen so they arrive on time. Um, 
that they have all the equipment that they're going to need. You know, they have their, they come with pens. They're not trying to find them and they're burying around in their backpacks for five minutes. They bring their devices with them if you need them to have those. If you have any diagrams or forms or tables, charts or whatever that they're going to be filling out, that you have them out and distributed before you start teaching the session. Um, if you need your learners to have preloaded any applications in advance um, onto their devices that they, they know about it and you get them to download it, that you've checked any technology um, ahead of time, you know, please, you, you know, you don't want to be the lecturer who's kind of faffing around for 15 minutes because they've not tested to see if this new audience response system that they're about to use um, actually works in this particular um, venue or as I've seen happen, this is the first time they've ever used it and they think the time to test it is on an audience. Um, don't do that. Um, if they need to go to a website or download something, have a starter slide up there when they're walking in and getting settled that tells them exactly what they need, are going to need to do so that once you start the exercise, boom, you're ready to go. What I'm going to show you here is how I use annotating um, with my finger or a stylus directly onto images or other slides during a presentation as an effective way of teaching. So what you're going to see here is a student group I'm teaching. The student here has an iPad that is linked to the projected display. And you can see that he is drawing on uh, where he thinks that structures move and when there's signs of volume loss. Um, I'm teaching at the front. Sometimes I'll have a second iPad. Uh, you can see here that his annotations are coming up as he does them. Um, sometimes I'll have a second iPad and I will use that to be able to override his annotations or add my own additional annotations. When the students have the iPads, I just get them to hand them on sequentially during the study like this. Um, the app that I'm using here, by the way, in case you uh, want to try it, and I think this is about the best I've found for this application, is called Dossiri. So we're going to move on now and talk about different types of um, exercises you can think about when you're looking at your learning objectives and how you're going to apply them. So that's sort of most obvious um, uh, active learning exercise or procedural workshops. Um, and depending on what you're trying to teach, these can um, be in a full high fidelity simulation lab, but there are a lot of low fidelity um, simulations that can also be done. High fidelity means it really looks like a real patient and it's got, you know, a pulse rate and a EKG and blood pressure monitoring and blah, 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 blah. But low fidelity can be something really basic, like, you know, a big blob of jello that looks like a breast. Um, phantoms are really useful for this. Um, your procedural workshop might involve live models, um, for example, for ultrasound or for positioning for things. Obviously, we're not going to do live models of biopsies. Um, there are a lot of uh, biopsy and needle localization procedural workshops, which are fabulous for teaching things like ultrasound guided biopsies or stereo biopsies or CT guided biopsies. I'm not going to talk extensively about this, but just things to remember with procedural workshops, they do require a lot of pre-planning. You've really got to think about these very carefully, getting the equipment together, think about the workflow. If you've got different tables or stations set up, you know, how long are you going to have uh, your learners at any one table? How are you going to get them to move to the next? Um, I highly recommend you need a high instructor learner ratio at these workshops, um, really, you know, a, one faculty for any one um, table, definitely. Limit your learner numbers. You're better doing several sessions with smaller numbers um, because people get really frustrated. They can't get their hands on. And you know, try, think about doing longer sessions. These often don't work well in the one hour format and you need one and a half or two hour formats. All right, so pre and post tests are a form of active learning. Um, you can use these to assess the um, learners pre-learning, if you set them for doing a flipped classroom type of session, you can use them to identify current knowledge gaps um, or their current or things that they know really well. So it can help guide your sessions. You emphasize the stuff they don't know. Um, it can also consolidate what they have learned, particularly the post um, tests and effectively therefore increase learning. Um, look at um, some of the literature on spaced interval testing and you'll see what I mean about this. So these tests can be some form for multiple choice. Those are often used, um, but they don't have to be. And they can be open answer 
They can have you um, complete a diagram, for example, say you were head students and their pre-learning was learning the anatomy of the heart. Um, you could then have them fill in labels for a diagram of the anatomy of the heart to make sure they've done their homework. Um, for post-tests, a summary can be used. We'll talk more about those later. For multiple choice, a lot of people are using audience response systems. These can be highly useful, but I really want you to think of um, active learning beyond audience response systems. Um, there's a, a variety um, available. The hard um, clickers that, uh, you know, you need the hardware there, attempts, such as Turning Point are fading out. In fact, Turning Point have turned web-based as well. Um, there are a number of others. I've named but some here. Nearpod, Poll Everywhere, Socrates is another one that some people use. And in radiology, I think Diagnosis Live is uh, one of the best ones. Uh, many of these have different formats that you can not only use multiple choice, but you can also have open response questions, um, several, including um, Diagnosis Live. You can have um, touch type, and uh, Paul Everywhere does as well. You can have touch images. Uh, of course, we love these in radiology to identify a spot. And depending on the system and also whether it's a paid for the free version, um, your respondees may be anonymous or identifiable. And depending on your purpose, um, sometimes you want one or you want the other. Here's just an example from Poll Everywhere. This is an open response, and it comes up with a word cloud. The question here was, what was your favorite app? And you, you know, as usual with word clouds, the larger font is the more frequent um, answer. And these are great as launch points for discussion about a topic. Um, particularly as one of the big advantages of it is it doesn't restrain you to, you know, four or five pre-specified answers. Now, when you're using audience response, you can use it um, for the entire session or part of the session. Um, do allow the trainees time to answer. You know, it, 10 seconds is a pretty short time. Once you get over 20, it starts to get really long for the people who answered. I usually aim to have two thirds to three quarters of the audience have answered before I stop. It is really important that you discuss the wrong answers, um, particularly um, ones that have been uh, picked by a significant proportion of the audience, because that's where a lot of the learning goes. Um, don't overuse it. Um, you know, if they're having to do this, like, you know, every three minutes, they're going to get really irritated. Do check the technology before you start the session, as I said. And I would recommend you inform learners in advance that this is going to happen for all the reasons we talked about. Um, Writing bad questions in any sort of a format, even this sort of formative type assessment is really irritating. They're not going to test what you think they're testing and they just frustrate learners. Um, you know, check out um, my video on YouTube about writing multiple choice questions. There's also a lot of other resources out there. Let's talk now about some collaborative learning exercises. So collaborative learning has been shown to be a very powerful learning tool. Um, it really improves the engagement of your learners. Um, they have increased creativity and in learning when they're uh, working together. And they really feed off each other in a very positive way. And there is often a little safety in numbers. It's kind of like, well, I didn't know the answer, but nor did he. So they kind of feel better about themselves. How you pair them up depends on what you're asking and what your learner group is. So I found often. Um, that you can pair seniors with jun juniors very effectively or faculty with a resident. And this might be in the same specialty. It might be um, across subspecialties for us in radiology. Um, in the groups, um, no more than five if you're doing a group. Um, you need sort of at least three, obviously, or it's a pair. Um, and again, you can either think about mixed learner levels or you can think about single learner levels. But if you're doing single learner levels, you're probably going to want to have stage level tasks. So you're setting a more advanced task um, to the senior group and a more basic task to the junior group. The think, pair, share exercises have been used widely across different types of education. Um, and you can start with a case or a question or a scenario. Um, and each individual is supposed to think about it in isolation for two to three minutes. And you really need to time these. So you kind of got to stop there with your, sit there with your um, stopwatch and get people to move on. Otherwise, time passes. After they've thought about individually, they discuss it with their partner and then they report back to the group. Now, they can all have the same question. You can get different inputs from different people, or they could be different questions, or they could be 
um, each different group is working on a different part of a more complex program so, uh, problem. So, you know, perhaps one is thinking about um, taking a radiology example here, how you might protocol an exam, and another one is thinking about uh, how you might interpret that exam, another one is thinking about the different management scenarios and so on. Um, and again, you really need to have very set time here. This is something I do with the students, I kind of call it convince me. Um, in this case, I have them um, pre-submit um, some work. So they sent a bunch of cases and they send me back their diagnoses, um, but you can do this live within the class. And I uh, match up learners who have different answers um, to a particular problem and I tell them they have to convince the other person their answer's right. And the thinking through of this, um, their answers, this so-called self-explanations is a really powerful learning tool. They really have to think through the rationale why they got to that answer and often they sort of self-correct along the way and see how their thinking was wrong. And self-explanations have been shown to improve their long-term memory. This is something I use all the time on the workstation in radiology and that's learning through teaching. So having, we saw before that teaching somebody was sort of that big um, bar base to that learning pyramid from the 1950s. And when you ask a learner to be to teach a different learner um, something that really assess, you are able to assess their understanding, you're able to clarify any misconceptions they might have. They might have got to the right answer for the wrong reason and it increases their long-term learning. So I will use this for a resident to teach a student or a senior resident to teach a junior resident and um, so on. It's a really helpful tool. It also means that you can kind of work this into your workflow. I'll have my uh, residents in ultrasound do little five-minute learning exercises where I ask them to preview a topic um, a few days before or um, the week before and present it to the other learners on the surface just as a, a quick informal teaching exercise. The exercise I'm going to show you now can be done as individuals or as groups. I touched briefly on diagram completion as a means of pre-assessment before. Well, you can have them complete a diagram. You can have them uh, complete an image or annotate a graph or assess a graph, evaluate an image. These can be done um, easily um, on an iPad or on paper, depending on what uh, type of thing you're doing. And so, so, so some examples here, labeling anatomy, um, differentiating between different tumors, labeling cellular structures, matching a CT with a diagnosis. These, you know, a bunch of these work better electronically than they do on paper, obviously, but you can be pretty creative about them. What I would do in the circumstances, I would make a PDF of the um, data that you want to show out and then send that out in advance. I use compare and contrast tables a lot. Compare and contrast is a very powerful learning tool. Um, you can either give people blank tables or you can pre-populate them with the criteria they have to compare. So I'm just going to use some examples here. The presentation or the treatment of disease A with B, um, the MR appearance of something, the CT findings of a tumor A versus tumor B. Here's one example that I've used in ultrasound. So they have to compare and contrast the benign and malignant characteristics of breast masses. In this case, I've given them the criteria in that left-hand column, but you don't have to. And you can certainly just, um, instead of giving them this, give them the, the blank column and they've got to come up with their own criteria. The so-called jigsaw activities are when you have uh, groups or pairs or individuals each work on one part of a complex problem for a period um, of the teaching session and then they combine and discuss the answers um, as a group. Now in radiology we're very familiar with the so-called hot seat case discussions where cases put up and the learner has to interpret this but try and take these to a different level when you do them. This is unquestionably active learning so we're doing active learning all the time radiology. Um, use critique so if you have Joe present the case, then ask Mary if she will um, critique the discussion interpretation. Now, when they first do this, the first time you do it, they're really uncomfortable about it. So you really have to make this a very safe environment and they feel this is okay doing this. Um, and then as time goes on, they just get used to it. I do it with students all the time and you know they just become comfortable and it's really um, both, the, both learners are uh, learning significantly from this. 
Um, think about using self-explanations I taught before. Why did they choose this particular answer? How did they get to that answer? Um, they increase your learning and often you'll find that, yeah, they came up with the right diagnosis, but for completely the wrong reason. Use patient scenarios. So perhaps you've done a, a bunch of didactic teaching about a particular condition, and then you're going to give a set of different scenarios. Perhaps you might give multiple scenarios to um, uh, set groups, or perhaps each group gets one different scenario. You can do this in different ways, but you can give them a history, physical, labs, imaging findings, and so on, and then have them come up with a diagnosis. So here I've given some examples. You know, perhaps it's management of patient of contrast reactions in radiology, or the imaging of patients presenting with hematuria, give them different sorts of scenarios to see how they would manage these different patients, how they would work them up, or jaundice. There are a bunch of games you can do. You know, you don't want to use all the time, but they're certainly fun to do um, to break things up. Um, there's a bunch of imaging jeopardies out there. On um, there's some templates on MedEd Portal as well as completed ones. Um, Diagnosis Live and some of the other audience response systems have it as team based. So you can have people who will be automatically divided into teams, or you can set the teams and compete against each other. I use ESAC, which spells case backwards, with our students. So in this session, we have a series of pathognomonic findings being shown. One student here is facing the image and describing it without giving the diagnosis. Um, and these students here are drawing the findings and coming up with the diagnosis. It's kind of fun, and it gets them to use the right terminology as well as to be able to think this through. And I, I explain it to them. So imagine that you're describing something to your attending on the other end who has no access to a computer. Um, try and describe it in a way that they can come up with that diagnosis. Summaries are a useful tool to, uh, again, this is part of sort of spaced interval testing, to be able to have them either um, recall their pre-work or at the end of a session to make sure that they learn something. So you have them write down three to five most important facts they learned from the pre-work. Again, have those cards and pens out already on the table and they can hand those in, they can keep them, they can share them with the class depending on what, what you want to do. All right, so now you've got some ideas of some examples of active learning exercises, and these are by no means comprehensive, so I'm sure you can think up some better ones. Um, let's think about how both the learners and the instructors adapt to an active learning instruction environment. So for both instructors and learners, this is a new way of learning often, and it takes a little bit of getting used to. So, you know, you need to be flexible. Um, as an instructor, you know, you might have your session defined like this, but it takes on a slightly different bent because perhaps one of the tasks you set is a little bit more challenging. So, you know, and the other thing I find is often you think something was extremely clear to your learners. You've conveyed it very well previously and maybe they haven't learned it quite so well. Um, so you have to explore that a little bit differently. So you have to sort of go with the flow. You know, but at the same time, at some point, you're going to have to call that, pull that session back in. Now, you, you may have to decide that perhaps you, you know, cut out something that you were going to do and you have to kind of rework it the next time. It is important to limit your learning goals. There is no way you will get through the amount of information that you will get through in a didactic session, but they're going to learn it much better. And so you've got to think how you're going to deal with that. Um, perhaps you're going to, some of the stuff that you might have had in a didactic session, you're going to assign as pre-learning before they ever come. All right, so in summary, um, active learning has significant benefits to learners. It increases their engagement. It increases their motivation. Um, you are uh, teaching to higher learning skills and it improves their long-term learning. You know. But be highly creative. Um, there are multiple ways of teaching a concept, um, but start with those learning objectives and then define those learning objectives, which are going to be most appropriate with this particular group, this particular setting, to use active teaching tools. And then, you know, sit back and reflect afterwards. You know, rev review the what worked from the session, get some feedback. Um, from your users and revise it for next time. You know, don't give up just because it wasn't perfect the first time because it's not going to be. Um, but, um, you know, move on the next time you do that session, you can tweak it. Thank you very much for listening. Um, you're welcome to email me if you have any questions.